Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Great to see many of you here in person, and I know we also have a bunch of folks joining on Zoom. So welcome to all of you. Um, this is the second Insights for Action seminar of the term, and the whole series, as you will probably know, explores how researchers and practitioners in Oxford and beyond are using research insights for action around impact and addressing uh, challenging social and environmental issues. And today we're talking in particular about the role of ownership and how ownership of capital can not just be part of the problem, but part of the solution, if you will. So not just at the heart of many of the challenges we face, but also leverage to remedy those challenges. And we're gonna focus in particular on the role of wealth managers um, and how wealth managers can play a role in changing uh, the relationship between wealth uh, and injustice. Um, I'm joined in the conversation today by Bridget Kustin and Peter Blabel. Bridget, many of you will know from her work here at Said. Bridget is a research fellow here at the school. She's also a fellow and affiliate of the School Center, and she's the qualitative lead on the ownership project. She's trained as an economic anthropologist, uh, focusing on inequality and social justice in a variety of global contexts, including recently focusing on family business, among other uh, investigations. And Peter is the CEO of Coots & Co, a private bank and wealth manager, and also a B Corporation, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and before joining Coots, he was the CEO of JP Morgan Private Wealth Management. So welcome to both of you. Great to be Thank in you. conversation. And I want to start with you, Peter, and ask you to give us a bit of the history of Coots and tell us a bit about how Coots came to be involved in questions of economic justice. Okay. Um, so uh, Coots is 330 years old. It's the seventh oldest uh, bank in the world. Um, and it's named after Thomas Coots. Uh, and he was leading the bank in the early 1700s. Um, and the royal, the association with the royal family started back uh, back then. So when most people think of Coots, if they know know Coots, they think of landed estates um, and uh, mobility and and inherited wealth, and we are all of that. Um, though today uh, the predominance of what we do is we bank um, twenty thousand successful and influential entrepreneurs many of whom um, are not multi-generational wealth, uh, first or, or second generation wealth. And you wouldn't necessarily call them when you meet them, um, landed gentry or, or, old, uh, or old wealth. And so when I first joined, uh, and the leader of the business doesn't ordinarily have this accent, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of uh, a good friend of the bank, the Earl of Richmond, now the Duke of Richmond, at Goodwood Estate, and we've been once been to Goodwood Estate. Uh, he said, Peter, you were, Coots was one of the first um, uh, people that we worked with, and you've been banking the family for 300 years. Why don't you come to Goodwood? Now, I didn't been to the estate, uh, so we're driving into the estate, and there's the Dalmatians and we're going to the bowler hat. And, um, and I'm just thinking, like, this is Down Navy, it's like, it's just, and then he says, it's, it's, it's jump into the car, and he's a, he's a, a motive, a motive sports enthusiast. So we jump into the convertible roller and he puts his foot down and we go around the estate. I don't know if you've been to Goodwood Estate, but it's extraordinary. It's got the uh, uh, golf course, it's got the cricket ground where the first rules of cricket were, were, were drafted. It's got the aerodrome where the planes from the Battle of Britain took off. It's got the organic farm. It's got the Rolls Royce um, factory for, for Europe. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, this is, this is quintessentially British. Um, and then he said, well, let's go and have lunch. So we're having lunch in the family pepper pot in the 300-year-old uh, family home. Um, and we're having you know, lunch on the crockery with the, the monogram of the family. He's telling me about the history of the family. The first duke was the illegitimate son of Charles II who married a French spy and was such a good guy, he made him a duke. And then as I looked out of the window, they were building for the Festival of Speed. So each year they had a really big um, car race. They're building this art installation, sitting in throngs, it's about four stories high. They're putting vintage cars on the, on the outside of it. And it just occurred to me right there and then that that's what I thought Coots should be. It should be the best of British and, and relish its history and nurture its history, but needed to be modern, relevant, and contemporary today. 
So we needed to have that history, but not live in that history, not expect success because of that history. And we needed to, to, to look forward. Now, maybe someone from an Australian background can get to that, um, that point a bit easier than, than others, perhaps. And that's what we've been doing over the last seven years. We've, we've transformed our, um, everything that we do. Um, and one of those areas has been what we're going to talk about, which is the approach to how we invest uh, for clients. Excellent. Great. Thank you. And I look forward to digging in more to that last little bit. But Bridget, I want to ask you a question. So Peter manages well. You've studied well. Tell us about what you've learned from your research on the relationship between ownership and economic injustice as a way into this conversation. So for four years through the ownership project, I was an anthropologist of families with revenue above a billion dollars a year in their operating businesses. Anthropologists call their method deep hanging out. This is literally the term that's used. I'm a professional party crasher, I like to say. The goal is to enter people's spaces, uh, their workspaces, their home spaces, so that one can hear how they speak to each other when they feel comfortable, because that's really different than how they speak when you're doing a formal interview with the audio recorder on, people are on their comfortable best behavior in those kinds of settings. And interestingly, one of the things that I was not expect, expecting as an outsider, where the fact of what they own is all that I have in my mind when I enter into a meeting, is how so many of the people with whom I interacted, both what are called the principals or the wealth holders themselves, as opposed to their next gens or the presumed heirs of that, of that wealth or those assets, uh, do not think of themselves as owners. The most responsible of them think of themselves as stewards. And the distinction they're trying to draw is that they don't treat the operating business as a piggy bank, right? They are good, uh, they're responsible with it, right? They, they don't see it as their cash cow, they're invested in the long-term fitness of the business. Now, as an anthropologist, that kind of logic within what we call their life world, it coheres, right? It makes sense to them because they are implicitly, actually explicitly, drawing a contrast between themselves and let's say, you know, reality TV stars where their fame is built on a kind of conspicuous consumerism, right? They're just spending cash as quickly as they can. And this is part of the point, right? So that's the implicit, explicit contrast that's being drawn. But from an outsider looking in, what really jumps out to me is that, well, the literal definition of steward is that you're in charge of something that you don't own right? The steward of a country estate used to be an actual title. You're not the landowner, but you're the person in charge of the estate. But technically, that's not the case here. They still do own it. And in the name of looking responsible, I think it's really useful to ask, you know, in an effort to look responsible, there's a kind of uh, scorning, perhaps, of the responsibilities that come with wealth. So if we take seriously the concept of social capital, where networks have value, where social relations have value. Even if someone is a responsible steward, not treating an operating business as a piggy bank, doing all the right things, but they're fundamentally saying this wealth is not mine because I intend to pass it on to the next generation. This is taken as being the most responsible posture. And yet, again, as an outsider looking in, I think it's pretty explicit that, well, you still are the owner, right? I understand you want to see yourself, as not having full entitlement to this wealth. And yet technically, legally, you do. What are the responsibilities associated with that? That for me is where the interesting questions start. This tension between people's aspirational view of themselves as a responsible owner versus the bare facts, which are you do own, you are accruing benefits, both social, financial, financial, material, immaterial, and I have it now. The problem with the anthropology is that we, we don't, as a discipline, have to land on the moment of, well, so what? What does that mean? And so that's why I like to be in conversation with practitioners, because I can introduce a series of interesting questions. But that moment of, so what? What do we go from there? Uh, I think is one that the, the industry is still grappling with. You know, what does a responsible owner look like? So are these the kinds of questions that your clients are asking or that Coots is asking as a bank? Yeah. Um, so when we talk about what we do, we say that we deliver, it sounds like a pitch, it's not, um, uh, brilliant banking, flexible lending, and responsible investments. 
uh, making sure that your wealth lasts and has its intended consequences. <coughs> so uh, back six, six, seven years ago, we asked ourselves, how should we be investing client money? And what role does ESG have to play in investing money, environmental, social, and governance? Um, and we did some analysis for a year or so, and we convinced ourselves that actually, if you invested with ESG filters, <laughs> you've got a better um, risk return as a result of that, because the companies that were uh, at the forefront of that were being run better, uh, that's the thesis. So we then asked ourselves, well, should we have a set of green funds to run alongside our existing funds, um, which a lot, a lot stroke most asset managers actually actually do. We said, no, if we believe in this, um, we should have ESG filters on everything that we do. So the only way that you can invest with us um, is, is with ESG filters. Now that's been a bit of a challenge over the last year. So since we started doing that, um, for three of the four years, it's it's helped our returns. And for the last year, it hasn't, because some of those areas that we exclude or uh, are underweight in um, uh, haven't performed as well as um, some of the other companies that in this crisis war, et cetera, have done very well. So we're and we're holding we're holding the line. We're saying that's what that's what we believe in, because we believe in through the cycle, it will write itself. And that those companies that are doing the wrong thing, uh, they have a higher cost of capital. And those ones that are run better, we get a lower cost of capital, and therefore there'll be a better uh, return as a result of that. So we asked our client base before we started, um, how would you like to see us invest? Would you want? Would you give up return in order to invest with ESG filters? Do you want the same or better returns, or do we have nothing to do with it? So it was 75, 25. 25 said, forget all that. Just give me the return. And of the 75%, a half would give up return. And the other half, the 75, wanted the same or better returns. Now, the good news for the 75%, well, 100%, is uh, until this, this year, we believe, as I say, through the cycle, we firmly believe you'll get a, um, a better long-term return. But that's the number. Um, there's the utility aspect of this as well. And how do you measure the, that feeling that actually I'm, it's not just the numbers, it's actually I'm doing the right thing by the planet. And so that's where we got to B Corp, which um, now B Corp, if you don't know, have a look at B Corp. There are 5,000 in the world now, 1,000 in the UK. UK is growing faster than the States uh, at the moment. Um, and you, not that it's a competition. Um, <laughs> and uh, you change your articles of association to say that you're going to take into account in your decision making all stakeholders. So the high idea is you do well by doing good and you take into account all, uh, all stakeholders. So it's a thorough process. It caused um, scratching the heads of B Corp, who are great people, because normally B Corps are companies that are inherently great, like a recycling company that sold it in a bank, right? How, do we, how are we going to do that? So it took us two years to get there, 200 questions across governance, customers, uh, suppliers, the environment, um, uh, and staff. Um, and you have to get to 80 points. And we got to 80, 83 points. And you have to, uh, 84 points. And you have to um, then commit to a period of, of improvement. So you recertify every three years. And you have to do it better each three years. And the, and the bar is set higher each three years. So we, we fervently believe in that. And then we had... Um, and and business convening power is just is, is, is fantastic. So we had uh, an event at the bank pre-COVID uh, with David Attenborough and Mark Carney. And if we're all as good as he's uh, Attenborough at 90, he would take it. He's just, and he mesmerized the whole room, 350 people for 90 minutes, pin couldn't be dropped. And he came up to me and he said the obvious thing, but sometimes the obvious things need to be said to you. He said, Peter, that's great that you're doing the B Corp thing, but the power that you have is the people in this room. So it was sort of a flash of the blinding obvious. It was like, oh, okay, all right. So we need to get ourselves organised. Uh, and then we had, hang on, what about our suppliers? Um, we need to talk to them. So if you want to supply us, you need to think about um, the principles behind B Corp, if not becoming a B Corp as well. And then we go to our clients and say, okay, you know, do you, do you believe in this? So we've got 60 of our clients 
So we started this process because two of our clients suggested it to us. So I'm not going to say that we thought about it. It was two of our clients. Um, and we've got 60 joining us on, on the on the pro on the the coming to big call. And then you go, oh, hang on. And and this is this is this is the challenge. The the climate uh, emergency, the climate challenge is is not an individual thing that will be solved. So it's not going to be solved by government. Government um, can be a catalyst, an important catalyst. Um, it is going to be solved by institutions, by not-for-profit, and by the business sector and us as individual consumers being involved with it. So they they are collective, they are collective issues. And so what we've started to do um, is we've now got ten um, uh, companies in the wealth management space um, uh, uh, who are also going down the route uh, of B Corp or at the least the principles of, of B Corp. And so that's the way in which we're getting. Excellent, really interesting. And for those of you who, many of you may know about B Corps, for those of you who want more, we had a wonderful session last spring on B Corps with Chris Marquis, who has a recent book out on B Corps and Mary Johnson Louie, who is the head of B Lab UK and also worked with Bridget on the ownership project. So we'll make sure to get the link out to those of you who are interested. Um, so really interesting to hear about the way Coots is taking this on, both in how you're investing and how you're organizing internally, and then also now in how you're thinking about the ecosystem of uh, individuals and organizations with whom you interact. And I'd, all, I'd also say it's not all plain sailing, so I'm just, I'm just presenting all the good stuff, haven't I? Um, you know, we've got clients, I said the 25%, um, and, you know, I have had discussions with clients, <laughs> and we're just going to have to agree to disagree. Um, and I still question what we should be doing to help them see a different version of the world. Um, and but perhaps the reality is is that it's going to be their their children and grandchildren throughout the country. Absolutely. I, I want to ask you, Bridget, because I know you've talked a lot about sort of owners and next gens. And where are you seeing pressure coming from? And where are you seeing new models emerging? We, we've heard now about the Coots model, but you've looked more broadly across the industry. So I'm going to take that question and turn it into a question for Peter. When Sir David Attenborough says, listen, the power is not Coots, but the power are your clients and the people in this room. I don't want to let you off the hook so easily <laughs> in the sense of within your sector, which is to say private banking and wealth management. That has been, I think, an incredibly absent piece of the conversation. People focus on wealth holders, they focus on what they do with their taxes, but no one ever really looks at the professionals who are guiding them and making those decisions with them, giving them advice, being the trusted advisor. And that's your industry. So, you know, from your, so to take Mariah's question and then turn it to you, uh, you know, from your vantage point, what has your decision to become a B Corp meant in terms of conversations, not with your clients, but with your peers? Well, not everyone's there yet. That's where the question comes from. Um, and, and some people are there for commercial reasons, firstly. Um, and, you know, is, you know, you can argue on both sides of the fence there. And there are other people that just fundamentally believe it. Um, and it will sound like I'm name, name dropping, but um, our New King um, has a sustainable markets initiative of which we're a part in the Terra Carta. Um, and he, uh, uh, he puts together um, industry roundtables and we're on the financial services one. And because he wasn't allowed to go to COP, he said that uh, he'd have his own event at Buckingham Palace. So we had an event there a couple of weeks ago. And, what he, and rather than have the industry tables, so I normally sit on the financial services one, he mixed it up. And so we had different people on the table talking about climate. Um, and I was going on, as I always go on, about collectivism and we all have to be in it together. Um, and there's a guy there that makes hydrogen cars. Uh, and he said, well, I agree with most of that, Peter, but actually I don't think it is all collectivism. And then we had uh, a debate about mavericks. And we, uh, we talked about Elon Musk and, uh, and uh, Tesla and said, would, would, question mark, would, would Toyota and, and General Motors forward, would they movie, be moving as quickly as they are on electric vehicles if it wasn't for Elon Musk running out, out of the front? Whatever your views are of Elon, put to one side, just conceptually that, that image. And so I don't want to say that we're 
that you know where tests are running running out. Mm -hmm. But I do think that they're in any of these things, and you know, the academics, you have the early adopters, and then you have the people coming along. I still think we're in the early adopter um, mm -hmm. ter territory, um, and a lot is question marked about greenwashing, and the FCA is going to come out with a new way of how you describe the funds, which is great. And I hesitate to what I'm about to say. I'm not so much worried about greenwashing. It needs to be addressed. What I think is being missed are those people that hasn't started yet. So, you know, the, the people have started great. Some people have started and haven't quite got it right yet. Okay, we should deal with that. But I don't think that's the next big issue. I think the big issue is the 85% that, uh, I don't know, 50%, 75% that haven't started. So your question more than me. Okay, well, how do we how do we motiv motivate those people? Now they're commercial people, so I would turn that around to say, well, if I get enough of our clients uh, demanding this, mm. then the businesses will follow. So I think they're probably a bit of a supply and demand For sure. answer to your question. One of the things that I find so fascinating and you know rich really about the the wealth management and private banking sector is that it evinces steadiness this is the proposition we will protect your money your money is safe with us we've been in this game for a while you can trust us and yet the industry is and and indeed coots has been around for 300 years uh, and yet if you talk to people in the industry the modern day wealth management and private banking is light years different than it was 20, 30 years ago, right? Revolutions characterize a field that presents itself as stable and steady. So what do I mean by 20, 30 years ago? Anti-money laundering, know your customer regulations. Those did not exist then as they exist now. Uh, one could buy money in Switzerland, uh, and I think that hide really is the accurate verb there. Uh, one cannot do that anymore. Uh, one has so many reporting requirements and disclosure requirements, not just for things like taxes, but even in the ways that fees are um, assessed for clients. Everything is more transparent. Before, schemey was the byword in terms of how portfolios would be structured. <laughs> And now, apart from resident non-doms, at least, or those uh, resident non-domiciled individuals in the UK, uh, simplicity is the byword. And to me, this is an important observation because in an industry that has this outward presentation as being incredibly stable and steady, and yet has been revolutionized in a pretty short amount of time, for me, that's the opening for change because it suggests that, well, Anyone who simply has recourse to saying, well, no, no, this simply can't happen. I mean, that would have been true 30 years ago if one was talking about transparency, right? No, no, this simply can't happen. So I am optimistic that that in the sort of chicken in the egg mutual engagement of service offering plus client demand, that the industry can and should evolve, right? I just can't see a world in which climate oh, considerations are not part of a standard risk assessment. So I, I would say to you, I think we're on the right track. So if, mm. I, if what I said sounded like we're on, we're on the right track, um, how fast are we moving? Are we and, and in the right direction? Um, could we move faster? I guess is. Oh, it wasn't a critique of you. Yeah. It was more about the. Yeah. It was more about the. No, I just that, thought, as you said, that's mm. what occurred to me. Is that mm. like we are heading the right? And as I we we had a wonderful farewell uh, last mm. night for a guy that's worked for us for thirty eight years. Um, and his, his farewell speech was just fantastic. Uh, and one of his early postings was to an office that we had on the border of Italy and France. Why did it exist? It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so it's the, the whole world of, of wealth. And by the way, the, the word wealth comes from the word wheel, an old English word, which means well being. So when we say wealth management, we're so focused on the dollars. Um, we and I fervently believe that we need to go back to this old definition of wealth management, which was the concept that uh, of of well being. Of well -being. And then you ask um, clients, "What is your money for?" Which is why we talk about, as I've already said, making uh, helping your money last, 
and making sure your wealth has its intended consequences. Now, what we do there um, on this generational point is uh, we, we, it's a game, we play games um, with our families and we'll go away for a day or a day and a half. Um, and we play these games to eke out the attitudes to wealth of the kids and sometimes the grandkids of the family in a safe place without having an argument after the second glass of sherry on you know, Christmas Day. Um, and, and that's fascinating. They're, they're fascinating things to watch because you just see that there are, uh, you, know, you just see all the different attitudes to, to wealth. And if it's mum and dad, it can be the grandparents, um, uh, they can see from their, I don't know, one that sticks in mind, three children, you know, a couple of years apart um, each, and three completely different attitudes to what the family's wealth is is for. Um, and so when we say wealth has its intended consequences, we've got to work out what that intention is and to what extent is it going to be reinvested in business? To what extent um, uh, is it going to do good uh, is it going to do good good things? So we spend a lot of time on, on that. So I want to ask you, just building on that as a sort of an individual who's really been at the forefront and leading an organization that's been at the forefront, what are some of the barriers? What have the challenges been to moving faster? I mean, you emphasize the need to really get mm -hmm. everyone in the industry on board. What's been challenging for you as you've done that within Coots and then tried to work across the industry? Well, I've been at the bank coming up to seven years. And the, the reason that um, someone like me was chosen as in not the norm, was we, we needed a bit of a, a relook at what we were doing. Um, and so I'm sure most people here have read Cotter's um, leading change, the eight step process. Hopefully all the MBAs in the room remember that. <laughs> session one of OB. Uh, and the first thing is to create, you know, create the, what's the first, the, um, the, the intensity of the, of, of the change. The good thing was that we didn't, we didn't need to do that because we weren't in a great place. So um, uh, and so people are up for up for change, and so then getting everyone to agree that this is the course of action. We actually haven't had uh, within Coots really anyone um, saying this is not the right thing to do, and really anyone saying that we shouldn't um, we should have a set of green funds alongside the old funds. Everyone really agreed that that was the that was the way. Now it's caused a little bit of head scratching because this year. Uh, performance has been off relative to uh, what it was previously, but but I haven't really had uh, anyone really saying that that means that we should we should roll back anything. So I feel quite positive about that. We've still got clients who just say, "Give me the best return." We we haven't lost any client that I'm aware of uh, because of that um, so far. I still have some interesting discussions. With particular clients about about that, um, so I I would like to say um, that I think we're running at about as fast as we as fast as we can um, on on that, um, and then I think Bridget would then say, well, what about the rest of the industry? And then I think it's up to people like me to get these industry forums going and create that same sense of. I don't think you can create the urgency, but you can just create the, the, the idea that this is just the right thing to do. Something that someone said to me was this needs to become like anti-smoking campaigns mm -hmm. where it just becomes unacceptable or it becomes seen as, you know, something that not the best in class private banks would be doing. Yeah. Right. So that those, because right now that tw those 25% have a menu of, your competitors that they could go to for a more traditional offering yeah. and a world in which the elite tier of you know private client offerings no longer do that would be yeah. would be great right yeah. i think that that would be a, a wonderful achievement but is the, is so it's going to be interesting actually i haven't really thought about this so the fca came out a couple of weeks ago and said there are going to be three categories um, and they're still working out what the categories are going to be but one's sustainable and one's impact and so to define more precisely what impact is and what sustainable is. Um, what is going to be interesting, I hadn't really thought about it, Bridget, is that your funds are going to be labelled one, two, or three, and then a whole lot of other funds that aren't labelled at all. Um, and what does that mean for the funds that aren't labelled? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Well, one of the things, my fear is that it could give you 
not you personally, but like the industry plausible deniability. What I mean by that is when I've spoken to private client professionals and private wealth managers, there's something of a bogeyman of the people who still do the scheme tax avoidance things. Oh, we don't do that. We don't take those kinds of clients, but yes, it's a problem. And then when I ask them, well, okay, you're not doing that. Your peers say they're not doing it. Who is exactly, right? Like literally who is that person and where are they? And, and it's, and then I get a variety of answers, right? Oh, well, the fact that tax advisors don't have to be regulated means that anyone can give tax advice, you know, from their like crypto trading closet in their basement or whatever, you know, that, that there's a, a whole suite of people who can operate in this kind of gray zone. Um, and so I, you know, I wonder what is the future of the industry, and this is us definitely forecasting here, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that this trend is only going to grow more private banks as they should, will start to do the kind of things that you're doing and saying our funds are just all ESG compliant, one, two, and three, right? And then is there going to be a sort of gray zone of uh, maybe private guns for hire who are yeah, you know, doing advice, right? I'm, I'm just, you know, from this. I, I think the regulated sector um, will move in this direction, mm. and so if you are FCA, PRA regulated, that's mm -hmm. that's a ticket to the game. Mm. Um, uh, it's the unregulated sector, uh, which I think, by definition, is always going to exist, because there are people that say that they aren't going to abide by the, the rules. Uh, uh, whether that's illegal or not, that's that's you know, if that's illegal, that's another question. Mm. Um, but uh, no, I think the regulated sector is moving in the right direction. I mean, we would say in the regulated sector um, that perhaps the reg some of the regulations uh, have unintended consequences. Mm. Um, so, for those of you that followed the UK industry, we had the retail distribution review, um, which was you know did and was meant to stamp out a whole lot of the stuff that you touched on. Um, it's also put a huge weight uh, of, of process um, on, on investing. Um, and so if we, if we step out of the ultra high and high net worth sector and then come into the, what we call affluent or, or retail sector, um, when you look at the, the ISIS here in the UK, which is the, I think the best medium term savings vehicle globally, um, two thirds to three quarters of the money um, is going into cash rather than mm -hmm. stock in the shares. That just, that shouldn't be the case. Um, and yet there's a lot of people that should be putting money into ISIS that aren't putting money into ISIS. Mm -hmm. And part of that is, is a supply issue in terms of the catalysts of financial planners that can hold people's hand to say, this is what, if you want to achieve that sort of uh, outcome of, 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 of income in your retirement, some of your retirement, what you need to do now is X, Y, and Z. Um, not enough people are getting advice because the cost of advice is too high and the cost of advice is too high because the regulations, uh, mm -hmm. now the regulators go, oh, you guys, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you, like you should see the wads of paper that we, that we produce that no one reads. The only people that read are our compliance people and make sure they're in, in compliance with the compliance people. So um, that that needs that really needs to be to be addressed. And then that gets into another. I lived in Singapore, Asia for a long time in Singapore. And the MAX, which is the combination of the FCA and the PRA, have a dual purpose, both to protect and grow the industry. So they have to protect in terms of prudential, but they have to work with industry to help grow the industry. So I'm a firm believer that I think regulators in almost every industry should have two purposes. One is to say, keep us safe from whatever you're regulating, but actually you want the thing to grow as well. Because if the regulator is just putting this foot on the, on the brake, that doesn't, that doesn't, it might, I don't think that helps greatly. Mm. So that's a bigger, that's a bigger issue actually. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then an ancillary point is um, when you think about climate, change and the carbon intensity of each individual. Um, yes, you can take the train or walk or bus instead of a car or whatever, um, and not take that plane trip um, and use, you know, use single use plastic. But by and large, the largest proponent component of a working person's carbon footprint is their pension. The way their mm -hmm. pension 
is investing. Now, when we do the market research and ask people about investing, and they go, I'm not an investor. And you go, well, no, you've got a pension. And they go, no, no, that's my pension. And you go, no, 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 that's, that's, that's an investment. And because it's been an employer benefit, lots of people in this country, uh, the most, vast majority of people in the country, are not thinking about their pension plan. So that's another aspect of education that we need to get across, is if you really care about, about climate, you need, to, you need to think about your own pension. So. That's a really important point. I mean, you've now touched on a lot of these external forces that can drive that can drive change or can for the better or for the worse. Yeah. Right. It's regulation. I think it's a great example there of you know, how might we think about it, you know, to counter the example that you gave an equivalent to the Better Business Act for wealth management, right? What could be mm -hmm. a sort of a regulatory push that actually incentivizes in the direction that Coots is trying to go? Yeah. And could we have that? I just think about that. That's a good idea. Yeah, how, how would you structure that? That's a, let's, let's take that on advisement. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And whether, because and whether, and if, it's, if it's sort of mandated, then the lawyers get involved. So whether it would be just like, you know, you're opting into behaviours uh, so they're not worried about being sued by someone. Um, yeah, that's worth my thinking about. Yeah, it's a good idea. So the elephant in the room, though, is wealth inequality. Yeah. Right. So baked into the premise of the industry is, if not the growth of wealth, then at least the endurance of the wealth that you are being charged to manage. This just doesn't square with social conversations around the harms of wealth inequality, um, especially for the, you know, the, the upper end. Is this just a you know, a, a difficulty that the industry has to come to terms with, or is there a way it can lead on this as well? And the examples that spring to mind are the trends of philanthropies that are not meant to, list, to last in perpetuity, but are meant to expire, right? To give away all of the money in their lifetime is the rise of something like a, um, uh, uh, a DAF, which stands for, oh my gosh, yeah. donor, advice. donor advice funds, uh, a donor advice fund where you get a tax benefit in putting an amount of money into a fund, but are under no obligation to dispense it really forever, right? Is that a, is that a worrying trend? Because it is a way for people to get a tax benefit without having to actually give out the money. Is there, is redistribution or reparative uh, philanthropy becoming a byword? I'm, yeah. So, you know, the tax system in the UK is is, is pretty progressive now. Um, so uh, if I get these numbers right. Um, so we're actually you know, before I start. So the average GDP per capita is getting up towards, you know, 60,000 US. So, you know, we're, we're a wealthy country. Um, uh, but when you look at the top 1% of taxpayers, which is around 500,000, um, they're paying... Uh, they're paying, uh, they're about 18% of the total income and they're paying 34% of taxes, top 1%, 34% of taxes. Um, next 9%, 1 to 10, is also about a third. And then the third is the, the bottom 90%. So you've got the top 1% paying as much tax as the next 90%. So that feels to me to be quite progressive in terms of the flow of of of, in, of income, um, but then you say, "Hang on, Peter. What about the the stock, the capital side of the equation?" I was going to say, "What about the life of Rishi Sunak?" Uh, <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> um, uh, I, I do think it's a good idea to have wealthy people and have aspiration. By the way, question is how much. Um, to me, the question is not so much the the flow mm -hmm. as in the income; it's the stock. Um, and then, and then, how how do we get more people saying actually, um, how much money is the right amount of money to transfer um, into the next generation, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, and what's the right number? Of them? So what we encourage clients to do is to give their money away as soon as possible, on a very simple premise, and it sounds quite. Um, Practical, but if you're alive, you can see what your money's going to do, and if you're not, then you can't. So, just practically, if you really want to see what your money's going to do, it's better to give your money 
to where you want to give it now um, and and push it away and not have control over it and enjoy uh, whether it's your children or the other things that you're Sorry, just to interject, yeah. you encourage your clients to give their money away as soon as possible. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that an average position? I think it's a practical one. I just, I just want, I don't know whether a couple of my staff up there were. Um, <laughs> Well, I don't think we're maverick in that, are we? I, I wouldn't have thought so. No, I don't think so. I think this is uh, now nowadays becoming wealth management practice. Ah, okay. I think it's just practical. Like, oh, I'd like, to, I, if, like, if I'm dead, <laughs> unless you believe in, you know, other reincarnation or something. But um, I think it's just practical. And then, then you're going to see how your kids, uh, if you're giving them to, to them, whether they're good stewards of it or not. And then you're going to see what's going to happen to whether you give money to the new business school here or, uh, is, uh, uh, or, or not. So, yeah, we do. Okay, so as long as we have several Coots people in the room then. <laughs> so let me just say that, you know, I'm aware of the, right, one cannot miss your B Corps status walking down the strand, right? It, we, yeah, we sort of shout it. You know, we, it is evident. But this whole point of actually encouraging your clients to not have the fund exist or the, the philanthropy exist in perpetuity to me is not at all a mainstream proposition, right? Yeah. Like business models of a number of banks rely on DAPs rolling over, right? Because yeah. they accrue their fees. You know, the, yeah. the, doesn't the biz, I think for many, myself included, the assumption is that the business model requires that the client leaves the money with the banks so that they can manage it. And if you're encouraging them to not do so, that's- Well, we don't want children to be poor. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think there's a degree of, of wealth that, transfer the question is is how much should, mm. should, should transfer mm. particularly at the you know when you're really getting into you know a lot of money um you know billions um you know that's clearly more than any one family yeah. Yeah. absolutely so i'm mindful of the time i want to open it up to questions okay. from those of you here and in the room and those of you joining online any questions for peter bridget or myself uh, thank you for your time. Um, just knowing that we're going to see one of the largest wealth transfers with baby boomers and the silent generation passing over to millennials to your earlier point around education. Do you have any thoughts of how large corporate like banks can help in that education to make sure that the uh, next generation are good stewards of that capital? Yeah. So you haven't asked the question, but within that, I think there's an interesting point. That if you're lucky enough to have parents that had money, uh, boomer parents that had money, you're going to inherit more than if you didn't weren't lucky enough to have parents that had money. So there's an equity point um, on on that as as uh, as well. Um, uh, the reality is that you know the the when we write our um, uh, text around investments, we write to a, a reading age of 13 or 14, um, and that's the that's the average. So the the um, the understanding of of markets and and investing uh, is is very poor indeed, uh, and so there's a huge education that needs to take place, not just about how to treat uh, you know, kids to, to budget, but about pensions. Um, that, so coming from Australia, we got rid of all these defined benefit funds oh, thirty years ago. Um, and so you have to put in nine and a half going up to 12 and a half. So a percent of your uh, salary. Um, and so it's interesting for me to watch um, how people think and talk about investments in Australia because their pension pot is a reasonable size relative to here where there's still a lot of people thinking that that's what their employer is providing for them. So there's, it's not a great answer to your question because but the, the answer is that there needs to be a lot more education uh, about, about markets and, in, and investing. But it's not the most, I, I like that, but um, hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, you can see people's eyes roll a little bit too, uh, as well. You know, oh, that's just, you know, someone else can look after that. Um, so you've got that aspect, that aspect as well. But it is going to be really interesting to see um, how this baby boomer stuff, we've still got another 10 years of that to, to play uh, to play out. Um, and it's an enormous transfer of wealth. On the higher end of the ownership spectrum, 
I would say when it comes to education, and this is not general populace, this will be niche, but that one of the most sort of quiet but potentially revolutionary things is going to concern um, the degree to which trustees, professional trustees, are going to support what their beneficiaries, the questions that those beneficiaries are going to start asking about how the trust funds are being invested and whether or not the degree to which those are ESG compliant and whether or not that is aligned with what the trust is legally meant to do and how the benefit and how the trustee interprets that. Mm -hmm. So I think education of beneficiaries so that they are aware of how to approach their trustees is going to be like a growth sector in your yeah. Yeah. in your world. And it's just it's only a matter of time before corporate trustees get shook up a bit. And I think that already happened with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where a lot of people who were kind of just chugging along as professional trustees suddenly woke up and realized, oh, wait, we actually have to be prepared for you know, certain unforeseen scenarios. The trust is not as stable as we once thought. And uh, yeah, I think that that, that will- So there are the trust, trust for big families. Um, and then there are these corporate trusts, whether they be a defined benefit or a defined contribution plan. Um, and there are others that know much more about this than me, but the, the trustee laws need to be, um, Need to be looked at so trustees feel comfortable that they're not going to be if, and they put in ES, money in ESG that someone's not and it underperforms whatever and someone's not going to take a, a hit at them in five years time mm -hmm. plus when you talk to the it's more the life insurance sector the infrastructure sector um they also want changes to the trustee laws so that the trustees feel more comfortable in investing in infrastructure uh, as well uh hi Bjorn. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the B Corp certification. Um, uh, I'm quite interested uh, in the space. And uh, so my question was, did the B Corp certification in any way shape your investment strategy or like your, uh, you know, like what your investment portfolio was? Or, or is it more on the operational side in terms of like, you know, uh, like employee benefits uh, and like maybe how you manage the operations of your offices and so on, or, or was there an impact on like sort of shaping your investment strategy as well? Uh, chicken and egg. So we decided to have ESG filters on everything that we do. Um, and then we asked ourselves, how are we gonna hold ourselves to account? And I was looking for a, a way to make us like numbers. Um, to have numbers to, to tell me that I'm improving or not. And then two of our clients said, you should have a look at B Corp because these 200 questions um, give you a mark at the, at the end of the day. And so that's why I've got relative confidence that we're moving ahead because of that, uh, that, that structure. Um, uh, are, are we making decisions differently as a result? Yeah, we are making uh, decisions differently as a, as a result. Um, one is we can't move too quickly, we've got to be careful. But, but you know, I'd, I would like to end up with all of our um, uh, providers of, of all of our vendors, providers of services to us being B Corp or have a darn good reason why they're not B Corp. Uh, or at least um, there's a business impact assessment. So you don't have to become a B Corp. You know, there's a free thing online. And for anyone that's got friends and businesses and whatever, you, they should do it. it. It teaches you a lot about. Um, areas you're not doing so so well in, um, and so uh, that's where I think we would get to, um, and then and I sit back and go, I'd like to say that we thought about all of this when we started. A lot of this has been iteration. Um, like David Attenborough, you know, Peter, you know, without your clients, oh, that's a good idea. Um, so I'm now on this this client thing of like, you know, we think <laughs> people the most influential and successful families and all, a lot of the uh, inf uh, successful and influential families in this country. So if I can convince them to get on the path, you know, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge lever. So I'd say to you, it's, it's shaped my thinking and broadened my thinking from just thinking about my patch to, and that's another big thing on behavior. So if you're a business person, you're brought up to compete. Like this, like you want to beat that person, you want to beat that person, you want to be fun. I want to have a better return than you. This thing on climate isn't like it's different. It's like it's it's not that. It's like we've all got to do our own mm. our own part. So for someone like me, I, it's like it's a it's a you know it's a it's a real mind 
mind shift. Uh, and then you'd say not everyone's, not everyone's there yet. Um, but I think we are heading in the right direction. I just have a question. Um, I don't want to get into a technical discussion about ESG standards, but like generally the E tends to crowd out the other two. And I'm curious about specifically the social aspect and whether that's a roundabout way to also deal with the risk of the widening wealth inequality that comes from yeah. essentially wealth management. We haven't at all cracked S and G yet. Yeah. Um, and and when we when when I talk about carbon intensity, I'm really talking about equities. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get into bonds and then gilts. And you now there's some lots of unanswered questions there. Um, and while it's not really what you, it's a little bit extra to your answer, your question. I think we've got to end up. So you know we've got when you look at a company's performance, there's the P and L on the balance sheet. Then there's the the cash flow and use of capital. We've got to work out how we come up with a, a another set of reporting that's human capital impact on on the environment. This is where it's like universities need to help us on this. Business. Well, actually, <laughs> anyone in here did the MT1 assessment on uh, the yeah. infrastructure bank? This was exactly what half of our students took on in October. Okay. All right. How should they account for how should natural oh, capital become a strategic okay. priority well, and what does that mean for the economy? Okay. Like so, so within your question is um, we've got laudable aspirations around S and G, but they're a bit rubble. And you go, I go, yeah, they are. So I should not do anything until they're set in concrete. I'm not sure they're ever going to be set in concrete. And so I've had lawyers in the room on this B Corp stuff going, oh, you care what you wish for. Um, you know, you're going to have some lawyer have a crack at you in five years time because you haven't and I go I'll just take the risk um, I'll just take the risk and you know it's like I try my best that was my belief at the time that'll be my defense if someone so I, I take the point but I, it's one of those ones where when you never start you never never get anywhere now that opens it up to people bad actors maybe so you to be careful about that. I'm going to turn to you, Jessica, and ask if there are questions from the yeah. people joining online. So we, we have a few questions online, all related to the next generation you yeah. talked about. Um, so I think just an appetite to unpack that a little bit more and think about when you're at those workshops with multi-generations and one family, like what are the youngest generations asking for? Um, you know, are their values changing and are their demands in line with shifting values? And are they happy with, quote, vanilla ESG or do they want investment in specific funds or specific sectors? So uh, it's tourism. It's it, the, 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 the reality is that the next generations um, have have these issues far more in mind than, than we did when we grew up. That's the reality. Um, uh, my grandfather was a farmer. I spent all my holidays on the farm and he, I'd say he was, he was uh, an early adopter in terms of his use of Phosphate or not the use of phosphate, um, but you know it's just not even remotely uh, the same as what the younger generation has. I I worry, and you're going to be really careful how you say this. Um, I worry that that a number of those views uh, are being held before life gets serious, um, before um, partners and husbands and wives and children and and first first mortgages. Um, uh, you know, life, when you have your first child, life changes. So uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that their views will change. I'm just I'm asking myself the question, will they have the same uh, degree of, of concern when, when the world changes for them uh, a bit? But that's just, you know, that's an interesting thing to work out, you know, in, in the future. Right now, um, they're, they're really concerned about it and they think this generation is is leaving them something that's that's sort of tarnished and it's your fault guys um and you're gonna fix it you go okay yeah I understand um and there are there are more more people wanting this impact investing um and and there's a role for impact investing we've decided not to get into impact investing but there are other people who are really good at impact investing so we'll partner with them I'm a firm believer in know what you're good at and be the very best at it and don't dabble in things where you go, actually, what you're better off to do that than me. So we're going to focus on the uh, responsible investments. So it's, it's absolutely the case. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I have seen one child um, who just said, you know, just give me the return. 
but to the next steps, you know, maybe he'll change his mind. Um, but I, I almost shouldn't even say that I saw that. I think that's just a, a, a very, very much an outlier. The reality is this is up front and center. The biggest difference with next gens is that they are growing up in this transparent world where they are going to be known and seen in a way that potentially their parents weren't, in part because of the uh, the way in which the transparency of wealth has changed and can now be knowable and seeable with the advent of ultimate beneficial owner registries with these now pretty regular leaks of information from the Panama Papers to the Paradise Papers. Spoken to a number of people who just say, you know, it's really not a matter of if, but when. Spoke to one lawyer who was waiting for the Delaware Papers. That'll be <laughs> a fun one. Any of you hackers out there? Um, but in all seriousness, uh, I definitely would not paint all next gens with the same brush of enlightenment because family dynamics are complicated. And I've been surprised by the number of next gens I've met in the context of the family business work who are acutely aware of the need to be taken seriously by their uncle or their father. It's usually an uncle or a father. And as a consequence, are quite conservative in their views, right? Because they are strategic and wanting to get into a certain position in you know, the, the family enterprise in some way. So I definitely would not adopt a mindset of the next gens will save us, the problem will course correct organically over time. That definitely is not true. I think the biggest driver is this knowledge of what kind of life do I want to live in an environment of wealth and equality where my status is likely going to be known. And what does that mean for the kind of life that I want to live, whether that's a life of freedom of movement in certain jurisdictions where there's credible threats to people's physical safety, uh, whether it means the kinds of friends you can have or the kinds of jobs that you can have. I think that, you know, so it goes back to this anti-smoking campaign point, right? Like, will having wealth and owning in a certain way exert too much of a social cost? Right, I think that will be a really interesting driver to be attentive to. But mm -hmm. I think part of why I'm so appreciative that we're having this conversation with you instead of say a next gen or some other next gen advocacy organizations like Resource Generation um, it is precisely because you're dealing with the wealth holder. And so to go back to what I said at the beginning, I just don't think that we can count on the great wealth transfer to solve the problem. I think it fit oh, okay. well without us being the capitalists to, to get it done. Yeah. So really interesting conversation. I, I want to invite you all to continue the conversation upstairs in the club room. We're going to close this part of the session, but we have a reception upstairs in the club room until 530. So thanks to both of you. Thanks for all of you for joining and engaging, and we hope to see you upstairs. Thank you.